Hello, my name is Ann Wynn, and I'm a space scientist at NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Um, today I'm going to be talking about the isotopic analysis of stardust grains in the laboratory with focus on oxygen-rich uh, presolar grains. Presolar grains, or stardust grains, are particles of dust that condense around mass-losing evolved stars, such as supernova and AGB stars, and they survive processing in the interstellar medium or space, and they also survive the formation of their solar system. Now, these grains were incorporated into asteroids and comets, and we can find surviving stardust grains within meteorites, interplanetary dust particles, and also cometary samples that were returned from missions. Now, presolar grains preserve their isotopic compositions of the parent stellar sources, and that is how we identify them in the lab. So this is an outline of the lecture for today. I'm gonna to first talk about where we find presolar grains and how we identify that they're actually uh, stardust grains. I'll then talk about some different analytical techniques that we use in the laboratory to study these grains. And then I'll talk about the isotopic studies of presolar oxygen-rich grains, including oxides and silicates. And I'll talk about how these isotopic studies can give us information about stellar evolution, nucleosynthesis, and mixing and also the different stellar origins for these uh, different groups of oxygen-rich presolar grains. And these origins include uh, AGB grains, supernova, and nova. Most meteorites derive from asteroids, and there are different classes that vary in the degree of alteration. We have uh, differentiated meteorites and undifferentiated meteorites. Now the undifferentiated meteorites are more primitive and are known as chondrites, and they contain materials that form during the earliest stages of solar system formation. They also contain presolar grains that are found preserved uh, within these materials. And recently, there have been missions led by NASA and uh, JAXA to retrieve samples from asteroids. And these samples will be studied to determine their presolar grain contents. Now, presolar grains are also found in interplanetary dust particles that are believed to derive from comets, which come from the cold regions in the outer solar system, spe specifically the Kuiper belt, and are believed to better preserve their original constituents. So whereas meteorites are collected on Earth, in the desert, or Antarctica, for instance, interplanetary dust particles are collected in the Earth's stratosphere. And these particles are more fluffy and porous than meteorites. Now in 2006, NASA's Stardust mission returned samples collected from the coma of a comet uh, called Comet Field 2, and presolar grains have been found in these cometary samples. So how exactly do we isolate these presolar grains? Well, the technique has been likened to the phrase burning down the haystack to find the needle. So here we have uh, a section of the Allende carbonaceous chondrite, and you can see these small little uh, inclusions within the meteorite. And in between, if you can see, in between these inclusions is this dark matrix material. Uh, which is made of fine grain, uh, mostly silicate material. So initially, uh, we would use acid dissolution technique, which involves dissolving the meteorites in a sequence of acids and then analyzing the residue. So in doing this, we were able to concentrate um, more robust phases, including uh, silicon carbide and graphite. Recently, however, uh, we've been using in situ analyses to analyze grains that would be dissolved in any acids. And in doing so, we don't really have to alter the original meteorite or interplanetary dust particle sample that we have. So how exactly do I identify these presolar grains? Well, as I said, these grains preserve the isotopic compositions of their parent stars. And these grains have isotopic compositions of many elements that are vastly different from any solar system material. So here we have a plot of the oxygen isotopic compositions for presolar oxide and silicate grains. 
And within this dot here are the compositions of all solar system derived materials. Here's a close up of those compositions. So whereas solar system materials fit into this little dot here in this plot, free solar grains have this huge variation of oxygen isotopic compositions. Now these compositions cannot be produced by chemical reactions and instead they require nuclear processes in stars. For example, this grain shows an enhancement in oxygen 17 and also an enhancement in oxygen 18. And the way in which these, this composition was produced was through hydrogen and helium burning in supernovae. So there have been many types of pre-solar grains um, identified. The first pre-solar grains were carbonaceous bases, uh, nanodiamond, silicon carbide, and graphite. And these grains were discovered by their exotic noble gas signatures in 1987. Now more detailed isotopic studies um, and the identification of additional pre-solar phases and subtypes, including oxides and silicates, were made possible by using a technique called secondary ion mass spectrometry, which I'll talk about later. Now what I want you to notice are the ranges of different sizes that these grains have, ranging from nanometers to uh, about 20 microns in size. They also vary in the abundances within uh, meteorite samples, from about 5 ppm uh, for the graphite grains to percent level for silicate grains. So what exactly can we learn by studying these pre-solar grains in the lab? Well, by looking at their isotopic compositions, we can learn about the nucleosynthetic processes occurring in their parent uh, stars. We can also learn about uh, how their parent stars evolved and any mixing processes that occurred, and also how the chemicals have evolved in the galaxy over time. We can also learn about what the major stellar sources of dust in the galaxy are. Now, if we look at the mineralogy and com compositions of the grains, we can learn about dust condensation conditions in various circumstellar environments. Now, pre-solar silicate grains are unique probes to these processes um, listed below. So by looking at these grains, we can study dust processing in the interstellar medium, processing in the early solar system, and also processing on the asteroid or comet parent body. Now in this talk, I'm gonna focus on the isotopic compositions uh, for pre-solar oxygen-rich grains. So now I'm gonna talk about some of the major techniques that we use in the laboratory to study these pre-solar grains. And the first one is called secondary ion mass spectrometry, or SIMS. Uh, this is a schematic of an older generation SIMS instrument. Um, and the way in which this technique works is we have a primary ion beam of either cesium ions or oxygen ions that comes down and hits the sample surface and then isotopes from the sample are ejected as secondary ions. Now the secondary ions are ejected and go through this electrostatic analyzer and then through this magnet um, and these separate the masses and then they come down and are collected and counted by this uh, either a Faraday cup or an electron multiplier detector. Now the spatial resolution that was achieved for these uh, first generation instruments was um, a micron or larger, and we can only measure one mass at a time. In 2000, a new generation of SIMS instrument called the NanoSIMS was introduced to Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, and this instrument has multiple advantages and differences over the previous generation of SIMS instruments. A major difference is that rather having an oblique incidence uh, shown here, where the primary beam hits the sample at an angle, the primary beam in the nanosims hits the sample with a normal incidence. Now the normal incidence angle and thus the smaller working distance of the primary focusing lens results in a smaller primary ion beam spot 
on average about 100 nanometers in the nanosims versus a micrometer. Now the primary and secondary ion beams are coaxial in the nanosims. So the secondary ions come off of the sample at the same angle that the primary beam hits the sample. So we can use the same focusing lens that is close to the sample to also focus the secondary ions. So this focusing occurs earlier um, in the nanosims versus sims instruments that have this oblique incidence. And what this does is that it reduces aberration in the system and increases the collection efficiency of the secondary ions. Additional advantages of the nanosims over the previous generation of sims instruments are vastly improved ion optics, a larger magnet radius, uh, which allows for better separation of masses, and the capability for multi-detection. So the nanosims has a much higher sensitivity or collection efficiency for secondary ions at high mass resolution um, than other SIMS instruments. So here are images of the nanosims uh, ion probe at NASA Johnson Space Center. And again, the major attributes of the nanosims is that it has a high spatial resolution, a high transmission at high mass resolution, the ability to measure multiple masses and isotopic systems at the same time, and also the capability of performing raster ion imaging. So here's an example of um, one of those images where we have the oxygen 17 to 16 isotopic ratio um, scanned over a portion of the sample. And here you see this hot spot, which is a presolar grain that is enhanced in oxygen 17. So with this instrument, we can measure the major and minor element isotopic compositions of single submicron grains. And why the spatial resolution is so important, um, as you'll find during this talk, is that many presolar grains are less than a micron in size, and we need this high spatial resolution to resolve them and to find them. Another technique is resonance ionization mass spectrometry, or RIMS. And this instrument uses lasers to selectively ionize specific elements. Um, so this instrument is really great for determining the heavy trace element isotopic compositions for grains that are larger than a micron in size. Um, and this is an image of the uh, Charisma instrument at Argonne National Lab. And Nan Lu will talk more about this uh, technique in her talk. Another technique that we use in the lab is called transmission electron microscopy, and we use this to determine the mineralogy, microstructure, and chemical compositions of presolar grains on the nanometer scale. Now here is an image of a TEM instrument at NASA Johnson Space Center, and this is another instrument called the focused ion beam, or FIB. And its main purpose is to prepare samples for TEM and nanosims analyses. And this series of images shows uh, the preparation method that is used um, employing the FIB for producing a electron transparent section um, for the TEM. Now these sections need to be 100 nanometers or thinner um, in, in thickness. So this is a presolar grain um, outlined here, and what we do is put on a series of protective carbon or platinum caps over the grain. We can then mill out the surrounding material and lift and produce a section and lift it out. And here we have the section before thinning. We thin it in situ in the instrument, and this is the resulting electron transparent section where we have the presolar grain nestled in here under these various protective caps. Now nearly all silicon carbide grains are presolar and they can be identified by x-ray mapping or isolated by acid dissolution which I had mentioned before. However, the situation is different for oxygen rich grains because the solar system formed under oxidizing conditions. So the majority of solar system produced material is oxygen rich dust. So we have this higher background of oxygen rich grains having normal or solar isotopic composition. 
So in order to determine a preselar nature for an oxide or a silicate grain, we have to determine the isotopic composition. And this is where SIM studies really is a powerful tool for determining their preselar nature. In particular, isotopic imaging in the SIMS instrument, which I had talked about earlier, is a very powerful tool because it allows us to map regions within a sample in order to look for these hot spots that you see here that are presolar grains. So it allows us to analyze more material in um, a smaller amount of time than we would if we measured individual grains. And I just want to point out that there are different phases of presolar oxides, uh, including corundum, spinel, hibonite, titanium oxide, and chromite, and also different phases of silicates that have been identified, um, including a non stoichiometric silicates, olivine, and pyroxene. Now, the study of presolar silicate grains has an added challenge on top of um, oxide grains. And that silicate grains are very susceptible to destruction by alteration, um, either in space, but also in the solar system uh, on the asteroid or comet parent body, and also by laboratory treatment. And this is uh, the reason why we can't use acid dissolution methods. So they're only preserved in the most primitive samples that have undergone uh, minimal aqueous alteration. So the, as I mentioned, they can't be chemically isolated like silicon carbide and oxide grains. And they also have very small sizes. Um, on average, they have diameters of about 250 nanometers. And this is why the nanosims was very important and actually key to identifying these presolar uh, silicate grains because it has the high spatial resolution. So this is one of the first uh, presolar silicate grains that were ever identified in a meteorite. And here you can see it is enhanced in oxygen 17 and depleted in oxygen 18. And because with the nanosims you can measure five to seven masses simultaneously, we can also measure magnesium oxide and the silicon signal to see that it is a silicate that contains magnesium. Now here I show the oxygen isotopic distribution of presolar oxides and silicates. And these points here are data for uh, red giant stars and AGB stars. Um, so as you can see, the isotopic compositions for these stars are similar to those of presolar oxygen rich grains that we measure in the laboratory. And this lends support that these grains do come from these red giants. Now, the ratios that we get from the SIMS measurements in the laboratory of presolar grains have much higher precision than these spectroscopic observations. And the isotopic compositions reflect distinct stellar sources and nucleosynthetic processes. So now I'm going to discuss the evolution of 1 to 8 solar mass stars, which are the major sources of presolar grains. Now stars spend most of their lifetimes on the main sequence where hydrogen burning occurs in the core and helium is produced. Now the star evolves up the red giant branch and during this phase the core contracts and the outer layers expand. Dried up episodes occur uh, during which the convective envelope extends down to the hotter interior regions of the star where nucleosynthesis has occurred. So during the first dredge up the core hydrogen burning products are mixed into the envelope and this causes an enrichment in oxygen 17 and a small depletion in oxygen 18. At the tip of the giant branch, core helium burning occurs and stars larger than three solar masses then undergo a second dredge up where the products of hydrogen burning are further mixed into the envelope. When the star reaches the asymptotic giant branch phase, Third dredge up then occurs and products from the hydrogen and helium burning shells as well as carbon-12 and S-process elements are brought to the stellar surface. Now with repeated thermal pulses and third dredge up episodes, the star evolves from being oxygen rich to being a carbon rich star. And at this time, carbonaceous phases such as silicon carbide and graphite can condense. Now this illustrates the structure of an asymptotic giant branch star. On the AGB, core helium burning is complete and we have a carbon oxygen core. The core contracts and the outer layers expand. 
and the star becomes a giant. Now an AGP star is composed of this carbon oxygen core. Outside of that is a helium burning shell and an intershell region where helium, carbon-12, and S-processed nuclides are produced. Outside of that, we have a hydrogen burning shell and a larger convective envelope. The helium burning shell is thermally unstable and flashes every 100,000 years or so. And this is called a thermal pulse. And following this thermal pulse, we have third dredge up, which as I mentioned, um, products of the two shells and the inner shell are mixed into the envelope. Now dust grains condense from material at the surface of the star and are ejected by stellar wind. Now during this talk, I'm gonna focus mainly on oxygen, magnesium, and silicon isotopes. So I wanna talk about the processes that affect these um, isotopes. First is galactic chemical evolution. And what this is, is it describes how the chemical composition of the galaxy evolves over time as generations of stars are born and die. And so the products of nucleosynthesis within these stars pollute the interstellar medium. Now, metallicity is defined as the mass fraction of elements that are heavier than helium. And over time, the metallicity of the galaxy increases. Now, the isotopic ratios also change over time. So we have primary isotopes, which are the major isotopes, such as oxygen-16, magnesium-24, and silicon-28, that can be produced solely from hydrogen and helium. Now, secondary isotopes are the more minor isotopes, such as oxygen-17-18, magnesium-25 and 26, and silicon-29 and 30. And they require pre-existing isotopes that are produced from the CNO cycle, in order to be produced. Now over time, secondary isotopes are enhanced relative to the primary isotopes. So the secondary isotope to primary isotope ratios increase with time. For example, the ratio of oxygen 18 to 16, ratio of magnesium 25 to 24, and the ratio of silicon 30 to 28 will increase over time. Of course, there are also nuclear reactions that affect the oxygen, magnesium, and silicon isotopes. And here I've just listed a few of those reactions that are pertinent um, to this talk. We have proton capture reactions on the oxygen isotopes, um, 16, 17, and 18. We also have proton capture on magnesium 25, which then produces aluminum 26 which is a short-lived radionuclide, and it decays into magnesium-26. We also have neutron capture on aluminum-26 to produce magnesium-26, and the silicon isotopes are mainly affected by neutron capture reactions, where uh, neutron capture on silicon-28 will produce silicon-29, and neutron capture on silicon-29 will produce silicon-30. We also have alpha capture reactions on the carbon isotopes to produce oxygen-16, and also alpha capture on neon-22 to produce magnesium-25 and magnesium-26. Now in AGB stars, these reactions mainly occur in the helium and hydrogen burning shells, and again, the products are brought to the surface by dredge up. In supernova, the reactions occur uh, within multiple zones, and I'll get into that more later. Now, in AGB stars, we also have extra mixing processes. And during these processes, um, we have material that has undergone nucleosynthetic reactions in the hydrogen burning region cycled into the envelope. And a consequence of this is that it enhances aluminum 26 and destroys oxygen 18. Now, there are two different types of extra mixing processes. We have cool bottom processing, um, a schematic which is shown here on the right. And in this process uh, that occurs in low mass stars, we have an envelope that gets close to the hydrogen burning region, and then radiative extra mixing brings this material into the envelope. Now during hot bottom burning, which is shown here, uh, which occurs in intermediate mass stars, material at the base of the envelope actually gets hot enough to undergo hydrogen burning, and mixing occurs via
convection. Now here again is the oxygen isotopic compositions for presolar oxide and silicate grains. And these grains have been divided into four groups based on their compositions. We have group one, which is enhanced in oxygen 17. The group two grains have this large depletion in oxygen 18. Group three grains have depletions in oxygen 17 and 18. And group four grains mainly have this enhancement in oxygen 18, but some of them also have larger depletions in oxygen 17. Now the isotopic ratios of most group one grains are explained well by formation around low mass red giant and AGB stars. Now dredge up brings the products of hydrogen burning into the stellar envelope, and that's what causes this enhancement in oxygen 17 and slight depletion in oxygen 18. Now from the oxygen 17 to 16 ratio of a grain, we can infer the stellar mass of the parent star. And that is because the depth of the dredge up increases with mass. So with higher mass, the dredge up depth is greater and oxygen 17 is further enhanced. We can also infer the stellar metallicity from the oxygen 18 to 16 ratio. And the range of metallicities agree well with these galactic chemical evolution model predictions. So now I'm going to discuss the siliconized topic compositions of silicate grains from AGB stars and compare them to those of silicon carbide grains from AGB stars. Now mainstream silicon carbide grains come from low mass and approximately solar metallicity AGB stars. And their silicon isotopic compositions shown here are largely governed by galactic chemical evolution. Now the best fit line through the compositions of these grains has a slope of 1.37. And this line provides an estimation of the galactic chemical evolution of the silicon isotopes. Now shifts from this line are attributed to neutron capture reactions occurring in the helium intershell in HB stars, which produces silicon 29 and silicon 30. And these isotopes are brought to the surface by third dredge up. Now silicate grains form earlier on in the evolution of HB stars when the star is oxygen rich and third dredge up of silicon isotopes is not as effective. So in the silicate grains, we don't see uh, these enhancements in silicon 29 and silicon 30. And so the best fit line that goes through the silicate data, shown in orange here, is shifted to the silicon 30 pore side of the silicon carbide correlation line. Now these two lines have the same slope, which give us confidence that they are indeed good representations of galactic chemical evolution. With the correlation line from the silicate grains gives a bit better estimation because it does not have the AGB nucleosynthesis contribution. So here we have the magnesium isotope compositions of group one oxide grains. Uh, the ratios are given in delta values, which is a deviation away from the solar composition in per mil or parts per thousand. So the compositions of many grains agree with galactic chemical evolution and asymptotic giant branch models. Now here are shown uh, HB models for various masses uh, and metallicity. And the open symbols are um, when the star is oxygen rich and the closed symbols represent when the star is carbon rich. So the spread in the oxide data that we see here indicates that the parent stars have a range of masses and metallicities. Now deviations from the galactic chemical evolution line uh, can be attributed to uh, 26 magnesium enrichments from the decay of aluminum 26. However, some of the oxide grains have much larger magnesium 26 excesses than predicted by the models. So this suggests extra mixing processes um, again, that produce aluminum 26 or possibly magnesium 26 production in supernova sources rather than AGB stars. Now, some oxide grains also have magnesium 25 excesses that exceed model predictions 
or oxygen rich stars. And this could indicate that um, the parent star had a high metallicity or that the grains originated in a massive star that experienced uh, the extra mixing process, hot bottom burning. As I said, the magnesium isotopic compositions of many group one oxide grains agree with galactic chemical evolution. And here are plotted the uh, magnesium 25 to magnesium 24 ratios of presolar spinel grains, stars, and AGB models versus the inferred metallicity. Also shown are three different models of galactic chemical evolution of the magnesium isotopes. Now the stellar and grain data are best fit by this Fenner 1 model shown here. And this model includes nucleosynthetic contributions from AGB stars. Now there was some debate as to whether AGB stars contributed to the overall chemical evolution of the galaxy or whether supernova were the main contributors. And the grain data seem to suggest that it's important to include this contribution from AGB stars. Now, technological advances have recently allowed for the magnesium isotopic measurements of small silicate grains. Again, these grains have on average sizes of 250 nanometers. And here's plotted the magnesium isotopic ratios of the group one silicate grains, which reveal four different subgroups. Now this plot on the right also shows uh, the model for galactic chemical evolution of magnesium and also the compositions of intermediate mass AGB stars, massive AGB stars, pre-supernova stars, and supernova mixtures. Now the compositions of the uh, so-called normal grains, which are shown in green here, follow the galactic chemical evolution for magnesium and likely derive from low mass AGB stars. Now the magnesium 26 rich grains that are shown in blue and also the magnesium 25 poor grains shown in red could come from uh, pre-supernova stars or also supernova. Now the grains that have these large enrichments in magnesium uh, 25 could have supernova or super AGB sources, and the grains with the smaller magnesium 25 enrichments could come from in intermediate mass AGB stars of high metallicity. So prior to knowing the magnesium isotopic compositions of these grains, it was thought that all of the group 1 oxygen rich grains come from AGB stars. But now that we know their magnesium isotopic compositions, we know that there's a diversity of stellar sources among these grains that all show oxygen 17 enrichments. Okay, so moving on to the group three grains shown here that again have depletions in oxygen 17 and depletions in oxygen 18. Uh, these grains are relatively rare, um, so there aren't that many magnesium isotopic analyses for these grains but it's probable that they come from low mass, low metallicity, red giant and AGB stars because they follow along this galactic chemical evolution line. So if they have these lower metallicity parent stellar sources and with some hydrogen burning have a bit of an enrichment in oxygen 17 from this galactic chemical evolution line. Now the parent stars um, for these grains formed early on in the galaxy and that is why they have lower metallicity. Now moving on to the group 2 grains that again have these very large depletions in oxygen 18. Um, I mentioned before that there are these extra mixing processes in stars and this would result in oxygen 18 depletions. Now cool bottom processing again um, shown in red occur in low mass AGB stars. And a lot of the grain data fit this trajectory quite well. Now hot bottom burning occurs in intermediate mass stars of greater than four solar masses. But previously it was thought that they produce uh, too great of oxygen 17 to 16 ratios and that they don't match the grain data. However, in 2016, there were new experimentally determined reaction rate for the proton capture onto oxygen 17, which then produces nitrogen 14. 
So implementing this new reaction rate, um, you can see that the hot bottom burning model does reproduce uh, better the grain data for these group two grains. So we have more of an oxygen 17 destruction during hot bottom burning. So this supports that um, some of these grains do come from intermediate mass AGB stars. And again, that goes along with the magnesium data that I previously showed that also suggests that some of the grains do come from intermediate mass AGB stars. Now, as I said, a consequence of these extra mixing processes in AGB stars is that there is production of aluminum 26 and also depletion of oxygen 18 in these group two grains. Now, grains with large magnesium 26 excesses um, those excesses come from the in-situ decay of aluminum-26. And here we have uh, the limit of the aluminum-26 to aluminum-27 ratio that can be achieved by just hydrogen burning in an AGB star. So grains having ratios that are larger than that suggest that this extra mixing process occurred. Now these two isotopic systems are decoupled during this um, mixing process. So the destruction of oxygen 18 depends on the rate of mass circulation. So greater rates of mass circulation will lead to greater destruction of oxygen 18. Aluminum 26 production on the other hand depends on the temperature or the depth that is reached by the material um, in the envelope. Now, moving on to the group four grains, uh, these grains have a range of compositions, but many are enriched in oxygen 18 and oxygen 17. Some of the grains have depletions in oxygen 17 and a minor portion are oxygen 16 rich. Now, also shown in this plot are the oxygen isotopic compositions of the different zones of a pre-supernova star. Now, core collapse supernova are the end stage of evolution for massive stars um, that are greater than about 10 solar masses. And this is a schematic of a pre-supernova star that is made up of concentric shells or zones that have different chemical and isotopic compositions. Now, a supernova explosion occurs when the star undergoes gravitational core collapse. And then the zones mix quite extensively and heterogeneously during expansion of the supernova ejecta. So we can perform these uh, mixing calculations of various supernova zones and can reproduce the oxygen isotopic compositions of these group four grains. Now the hydrogen and helium nitrogen zones are a source of oxygen 17. Oxygen 18 is produced in the helium carbon zone and the three oxygen rich zones here are sources of oxygen 16. Now the supernova sources of these group four grains are also supported by observed isotopic anomalies and other elements as well. Now here are the magnesium isotopic uh, compositions of group four silicate and oxide grains. And as you can see, many of them have depletions in magnesium 25 and enrichments in magnesium 26. Now this diagram is what we call a spaghetti diagram that shows the isotopic compositions of various elements across different supernova zones. And this is the mass coordinate. So this is the interior of the pre-supernova star out to the envelope. Now these plotted ratios come from uh, supernova models. So as I stated, oxygen 18 that we observe in the grains can be attributed to material from this helium carbon zone. Oxygen 17 comes from the hydrogen envelope. And magnesium 26 is produced in the oxygen neon and oxygen carbon zones. And the magnesium 25 depletion that we observe in the pre-solar grains can be attributed to material in the helium carbon zone. So as you can see, we must mix material from various zones uh, of the pre-supernova star to reproduce the isotopic compositions of these grains.
In a study performed in 2014, eight presolar silicate greens were analyzed for their oxygen, silicon, magnesium, and iron isotopes. Uh, we then performed supernova mixing calculations using a 15 solar mass supernova model to try and fit the grain data. Now the grain data are shown here as the color symbols and the supernova model calculations are shown as open symbols. And as you can see, we found that mixing less than 2% of inner zone material with the outer zones produces really good fits to all of the isotopic compositions that were measured with a few discrepancies. For two of the grains, we found that the model underproduces oxygen 17. And better fits could be obtained if we use supernova models having lower mass than 15 solar mass. We also found that the supernova model underproduces silicon 29 for half of the silicate uh, presolar grains. Now, in 1998, Trevaglio et al. suggested that the production of silicon 29 in the oxygen neon and oxygen silicon zones should be doubled. And this modification was also invoked to explain some unusually silicon 29 rich supernova silicon carbide grains. And we found that if we doubled the silicon 29 yield in the oxygen neon and oxygen silicon zones, we were in fact able to reproduce uh, the isotopic compositions that were measured in the presolar grains. So this is a great example of how we can use the grain data to constrain um, astrophysical models. Another discrepancy is we found that the models uh, produce these excesses in iron 54 that we don't observe in our grains. And this is also the case for presolar silicon carbide grains from supernova. So one explanation of why we don't see this enhancement of iron 54 is that there's elemental fractionation in the silicon to sulfur zone, meaning that the iron isn't actually incorporated into the grain, but the silicon is. So recently there have been technical developments that have enabled analysis of chromium isotopes with high spatial resolution. Now, previous analysis of um, oxide residues hinted at a presolar 54 chromium component, and these were identified recently um, to very small oxide grains having sizes from 40 to 300 nanometers. And the study by Nitt et al. found that the anomalies increased with decreasing grain size. And this chromium-54 enrichment is likely the carrier of bulk chromium variations that are observed in solar system materials. Now these plots show the chromium isotopic compositions of the oxide grains compared to models for 15 solar mass core collapse supernova, high density supernova 1A, and electron capture supernovae. Now, chromium-54 is made of massive stars by neutron capture during core helium burning and shell carbon and neon burning. Now, if we look at the chromium-53 to 52 ratios of the grains, we find that the supernova-2 models uh, don't match the data very well. They generally produce a lot of chromium-53, which is not observed. Now, supernova-1a occur due to accretion of material from a companion star onto a white dwarf star in a binary system. Now the mass of the white dwarf gets large enough to ignite carbon fusion, which then leads to an explosion. Now the models for this source fits the grain data if the measured enrichments in chromium 50 are attributed to titanium 50 enrichments and not chromium 50 enrichments. So here in this plot, you can see that the high density supernova uh, 1A models fit the data very well if the 50 enrichment is attributed to titanium. The high density supernova 1A and also the electron capture supernova um, are expected to have depletions in chromium 50, but the data are well fit if it's attributed to titanium 50. Now, electron capture supernova um, are another possible source for these grains. 
Now these stars have an electron degenerate oxygen, neon, and magnesium core surrounded by a massive envelope. And at high temperature and density, neon and magnesium captures the electrons, which leads to loss of pressure support, and then the core collapses and explodes. Now these electron capture supernovae are more probable sources for these grains because they're expected to be more prolific and evolve on shorter timescales than high density supernova 1A. And you can see again that the models for these electron capture supernovae uh, fit the data quite well. Now the existence of supernova 1A and electron capture supernova are kind of theorized. Now ECSN were theorized uh, to exist about 40 years ago and only very recently has there been actual evidence of an actual electron capture supernova. So this lends uh, more support that these presolar chromite grains having these chromium anomalies um, do actually come from electron capture supernova. Now lastly, I will discuss uh, the grains that have these extreme oxygen 17 enrichments. Now these enrichments exceed the limit of what can be produced by nucleosynthesis in AGB stars, which is about four uh, times 10 to the minus three. Now NOVA produce abundant oxygen 17 through explosive hydrogen burning. And here is the oxygen isotopic composition of one NOVA model. Now as shown in this artist's depiction here, NOVA occur when hydrogen rich envelope material from a companion star accretes onto a white dwarf and explodes. Now, previous NOVA models produced a very large amount of oxygen 17, but also very large amounts of oxygen 18. And these models do not fit the pre-solar grains data. And two of those grains are shown here. Now, updated reaction rates for proton capture on oxygen 17 and also proton capture on fluorine 18 resulted in lower predicted oxygen 18 abundances in these NOVA models. So here is shown the oxygen isotopic compositions of very oxygen rich silicates and oxides compared to CO and oxygen neon NOVA models of various masses. So while the previous NOVA models produced too much oxygen-18, the new NOVA models seem to be depleted in oxygen-18. These are the model calculations here. However, if material from NOVI with these model compositions were diluted with material having more solar isotopic compositions, then the grain data can be reproduced. So the oxygen isotopic compositions of presolar silicates are best matched by strong dilution of this 1.15 solar mass carbon oxygen nova with isotopically close to solar material. And it's possible this uh, material came from the companion star or um, the interstellar medium. So in this case, only 2% of the pure NOVA material is required to reproduce the composition of the presolar grain. Now the composition of oxide T54 um, is better fit by dilution of a approximately one solar mass carbon oxygen NOVA model. So here are the magnesium isotopic compositions of the probable NOVA grains compared to the NOVA models. Now the grains are enriched in magnesium 25 and some are also enriched in magnesium 26. Now as with oxygen isotopes, most of the NOVA models predict uh, much more extreme enrichments in magnesium 25 and 26 than are observed in the presolar grains. Now the magnesium compositions of most of the presolar grains could be consistent with uh, the model for a 0.6 solar mass CO NOVA with a relatively small dilution. However, the grain data are also matched by strong dilution of any of the other NOVA models. The source of the large 26 magnesium enrichment of grains C48 is unknown as they do not match uh, any of the models. 
Here is shown the siliconized topic compositions for the oxygen 17 rich presolar silicate grains. One of these grains has uh, enrichment in silicon 29, and two grains has small 30 uh, silicon enrichments. Most of the NOVA models produce large uh, depletions in silicon 29, and one model is enriched in silicon 29 and silicon 30. So the silicon isotopic ratios of two presolar silicates are matched by the 0.6 solar mass carbon oxygen NOVA, but also strong dilution of most of the NOVA models. The silicon 29 enrichment of grain 47 can be matched by strong dilution of the 1.35 solar mass oxygen neon NOVA. To summarize the results of the possible NOVA presolar grains, uh, the oxygen isotopic compositions of the grains are best matched by strong dilution of 1.15 solar mass CO NOVA. On the other hand, the magnesium and silicon isotopic compositions are most consistent with a 0.6 solar mass CO NOVA or strong dilution of other NOVA models. Of course, the same model and scenario should fit all of the measured isotopic compositions. So strong dilution of the 1.15 solar mass CO NOVA does fit the oxygen and magnesium data for most of the grains, but dilution of this model does not reproduce uh, the silicon 29 enrichment that is observed in some of the silicate grains. So there's still work to be done here to constrain the sources of these very oxygen 17 rich presolar grains. Now I want to point out that new CO NOVA model simulations do match the isotopic compositions of some uh, possible NOVA grains without having to invoke dilution, but this mainly applies to presolar silicon carbide grains and not oxygen rich grains. Also, some silicon carbide grains that were thought to be NOVA grains were determined to be more likely supernova grains uh, as more isotopic analyses were conducted on them. And this is similar to the case for the group one oxygen rich grains that I talked about earlier on in the lecture that were all thought to be AGB grains, but are now um, likely to come from diverse sources. I hope I have demonstrated throughout this lecture that the isotopic analysis of bona fide presolar status grains in the laboratory is an extremely powerful method for conducting astronomy and for studying astrophysics. Now this work allows for very tight constraints to be placed on models of stellar evolution, mixing, nucleosynthesis, and galactic chemical evolution. And what's especially important and key to placing these constraints is measuring the isotopic compositions of multiple elements within single grains. And this has allowed us to identify presolar oxygen rich grains from AGB stars, super AGB, supernova, electron capture supernova, and also nova stars. Now some presolar grain types have sizes of several microns in diameter, and this makes it a bit easier to conduct multiple analyses on individual grains. However, this task is more complicated for most uh, presolar silicate grains, for instance, which are only a quarter of a micron in size on average. So conducting multiple analyses of these grains has required technological advances, such as the NanoSIMS instrument, and the future will likely bring new advanced instrumentation and new developments in the study of presolar grains.